actually, and the honor is all mine that you guys would uh, uh, accept the, uh, the time here. Uh, the uh, presentation itself is not about um, the uh, Computer Museum, the Commercial Computing Museum, which we established in Waterloo in the 90s. So if I could just uh, talk a, a second about that before we get into it. In about 1984, I realized that Ryan and his two brothers would not be able to see what caused me to get into the computer field and stay in high tech all these years because uh, control panels which was my romantic attachment to high technology, they're gone, right? Uh, in the 80s, so went, as, as uh, machines started to shrink, reliability increased, control panels went. So that was the impetus that led to me contacting leasing companies, saying as soon as uh, uh, Sears, Stelco, when those companies send back their old hardware because the lease is expired, could I please have the control panels? And they were so tickled, they thought this was a, a, a silly thing that Sure, they, I, I was getting calls all the time for people uh, offering, you know, if you go to this site, you'll get this. If you go to that site, you'll get that. And then um, somebody said, uh, well, I mean, you could have the whole computer. And I got thinking, how stupid is that? Who'd want to save a whole mainframe? Who could possibly do that? But then it became a reality that I was actually cannibalizing. So we had the opportunity to rescue all these old mainframes and uh, I wasn't. I was just going for the control panel for almost selfish reasons now. And so it evolved into collecting the entire system. So of course, when you get a company that would either spend $5,000 to have movers come in and remove the, uh, the, uh, the equipment from the data center, or call this guy in Kitchener and he'll do it for free, you know. So that's how we acquired 60 tons worth of uh, hardware. And so you'll see a lot of it uh, in here in uh, a few of the slides. And, but the thing, the bottom line too is, is that real computers have control panels. You guys don't have real computers here, right? <laughs> Sorry. Well, we have the basic floor. That's true, but it's hidden. Panel. Yeah, the control panel is <laughs> hidden. But, um, so thanks, and that's, that's, the, uh, that's how uh, computers got into uh, the Stumpf household. So, uh, the grassroots history of early high tech the early high-tech community in Kitchener, Waterloo. That's going to be our focus. And uh, it's all about stories, so let's tell some stories. In, uh, my dad worked for Electra Home for 43 years, and it wasn't his first job. One of his first jobs was sitting out at the uh, transformer, sorry, at the transmitter on, on Baden Hill. And uh, when thunderstorms or inclement weather would come out, he'd be the guy to turn it off quickly or to reset it if the lightning did hit it. That was one of his first jobs. So we were the first on the street with a TV. We had the old, you know, the original round one. We were the first ones on the street to take down our antenna and replace it with cable, Grand River Cable at that time, now part of Rogers. And I believe, too, we were the first ones on the street to use a computer. And that was probably my honor. In 1966, U of W christened the Math and Computer Building, in pretty well now in the center of the campus. And uh, they deliberately built uh, a homage to computing technology at that time. It was the building was designed around the data center, and you'll see that also. So that, coupled with the fact that you know the basement was full of uh, half-completed electronic projects, whether it was transistors or even vacuum tubes with my dad, and uh, the space program was, uh, was 1966, the you know, three more years are going to be landing on the moon. So it was just, it was just you know, right time for me to be picked to get into high tech. So I collected all those computers all that stuff, and then uh, we moved around town. So every time, you know, as the collection grew, the current facility was inadequate. We just didn't run out of space, but we needed loading docks and things like that. So we found the perfect, really cheap stuff, because this was coming out of the Stump family pockets. And uh, we found space in what's called the Lang Tanning Building. Now, if you know Victoria Street and King Street in downtown Kitchener, that's the intersection we're talking about. And so about... Uh, she was now. I guess six years ago, uh, all the tenants in that building received an eviction notice. They were going to convert the building into lofts, right? And so that was successfully done in downtown Kitchener. The old um, Kaufman Rubber or the Kaufman Shoe Building is now lofts. So that happened successfully. But instead of making the Lang Tanning Building into lofts, they made it into corporate lofts or businesses. And uh, there's a very large organization in Kitchener Waterloo called Communitech and that's the Community Technology Association. 
they're the ones that you would go to if you have an idea for uh, some new software, hardware product. Communitech's got all the expertise and all the contacts with angel investors, etc. So Communitech moved into the Lang Canning building, and then there's a federal government, the Federal Network, Video Network, something or other is in that building also. And then uh, Google moved into that building, and then Desire to Learn moved into that building. So I thought it would be so interesting if I was to show photographs of the space that I used and how that space is currently being used. And so uh, uh, I approached Google and Communitech and they didn't see any value in it, but uh, I went ahead anyways and it's been a lot of fun showing people uh, radio amateur groups, computer user groups, and now finally I've been able to get to the museum group. So. <laughs> oh, you know, these, these personal computers. Where's I'm using the, the arrow keys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't just the... Uh... It should just work. We should have. <coughs> there we go. I think I was just not hitting hard enough. Sorry. I'm used to tapping now, not even clicking, right? There you, you go. You, you tap. So this is my document to be. It's not going to be a personal memoir. I'm not going to give you, it's not going to be presented in a particularly, you know, historical, a traditional historical format. But please bear in mind that all the stories you're going to hear about, uh, I was a part of. I was a, a witness in the first party or at least the second party having dealt with the people who actually, uh, you know, whose, whose stories, they were the players in these actual stories. So. We are going to talk about uh, some good stories, but please bear this in mind. So why do high-tech companies seem to flourish in Kitchener-Waterloo? As I put these slides together, it, this is now two years old. It was 2011 when this was put together. Uh, a theme came through, and I wasn't expecting it to, uh, to happen, but please bear that in mind while we're talking. So if you were to ask an academic, why, do high -tech, why does high-tech flourish in certain communities versus other communities, these are the four key ingredients. Synergy, you need a venture capital pool, you need a talent pool, and you need an infrastructure. Well, let's focus on synergy, because synergy comes out of community, and we're talking about the early high-tech community, the roots of high-tech in Kitchener-Waterloo. So if you've been to Kitchener-Waterloo, you know, you've seen the, the buggies, and uh, there's this is a... Uh, Peter Ektrel Snyder uh, watercolor of the uh, Westmont Rose Covered Bridge. That's what people think of when they st still think of when they think of Kitchener Waterloo. I think this is the way we should think of it. It's this remarkable mix. You can't be anywhere in Kitchener Waterloo and not be out in the rural areas within minutes. And yet, you can't go anywhere near the campus of U of W since 1956 and not seen at least you know a 40 foot dish rotating around at the Raytheon plant on Phillips Street. So we're going to spend some time talking about six companies, Electrohome, Marsland Engineering, Raytheon, NCR, Volker Craig, and Hewlett Packard. So, and we've got a 50-50 there. So um, Raytheon, NCR, and HP are our American firms, whereas Electrohome, Marsland, and Volker Craig are homegrown Kitchener-Waterloo companies. And at the center of it all, though, too, we can't ignore U of W's contribution to this history. If we were to talk about all the companies and, and try to cover all the companies that are in Water Kitchener-Waterloo just now, considered to be high-tech companies, it's currently, so says Communitech, 827 uh, you know, le legally registered corporations right now. But you can see, this is a tech map from uh, 1998 or sorry, okay, 1999, and it was done by a uh, accounting firm, and what these tech maps do, if you can get a hold of them, is uh, it shows these core companies, Raytheon, um, Electrohome, and then it shows the offshoots. So for instance now, if you were to follow Electrohome, Electrohome is now Christie Digital. Electrohome were in TVs, then they got into projection TVs, projection systems, and then they sold that off to Christie excuse me, Christie Digital, and now Christie Digital sells uh, projection systems replacing uh, the uh, film projectors in uh, movie theaters. Now, I got, I got a, a 
this is the humorous slide. So, but I'd like to, to preface this with uh, the question, how many uh, museum volunteers does it take to replace a light bulb? Okay, 32. One that actually changed the light bulb and 31 to talk about how good the old one was. So likewise, in Kitchener, Waterloo, Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph, and Cambridge. Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph, and Cambridge. Four points. Yeah, if, yeah, if you went that far. They formed uh, Canada's technology triangle. So I, got, I always got a kick out of that. We're trying to be so sophisticated internationally, and this was the political arm of those communities to sell, you know, to sell the, the communities to companies around the world. Come, invest here, stay here. Come to our four-pointed triangle. So I always got a kick out of that. Now Guelph did bow out of the of Canada's technology triangle. So now we do have three points. But if if you continue with the original logic, well, Kitchener Waterloo is really only one point because it's a twin city. Well, now you've got a line. You know, you've got Cambridge and then Kitchener Waterloo. Real slick. So, please, too, after you get the gist of what we're talking about here, if you've got stories, please let me know. And also, you need to know, uh, even though Ryan and I come from Kitchener and Ryan actually lives in Waterloo, we are not serial entrepreneurs. We do not drive Maseratis. We're not, I'm not even a really good techie. Um, but I've, been exper I've witnessed all these interesting stories and I thought it was incumbent on me to get them out in the field because it's some really wild stuff happened way before RIM. Isn't that Peter? In that, in that picture? Peter Noel? Yeah, Pete Noel. He's, he made a donation. He, when, I, when I mentioned it, yeah, he yeah. mentioned that. Yeah. Yes. Scary that I remember. Um, may I please tell you about that? <laughs> um, there's a, an organization in Kitchener Waterloo called the House of Friendship. And uh, it takes, it, it helps um, uh, single men uh, with accommodations and training and things like that. We wanted to, to uh, use the collection that we had in the Lang Tanning building to some good, because it was just collecting dust. And so uh, we, uh, Pete and I, put this idea together. Pete's, Pete's passion are PCs, IBM PCs. So he, he, he had at one point every model, every variation, you know, that kind of thing. Original box, original styrofoam, everything. So uh, we uh, cleaned up the uh, space at the warehouse, and we had an IBM 1800, uh, PDP 8 something, uh, an old card sorter, an IBM 083 card sorter, stuff like that on one side. And then at waist height, we had this counter made out of two by fours that had all the uh, PCs all lined up and running. And um, so the House of Friendship has a monthly newsletter, so they put in their newsletter that this was going to happen in the Lang Tanning building. It was going to be a free will offering, bring the family down for an afternoon on a Saturday. And uh, somehow, somebody at the KW Record uh, saw this and then dropped it on the photographer who handles the uh, special photographs for the Saturday section of the paper, or the Saturday paper, which tends to be, you know, it used to be thicker. and. Um, what he did then is he phoned us up and said he'd like to do the center spread uh, of uh, the business section. So we had the entire second, you know, the, the entire spread of that section, and we didn't even seek the publicity. You know, so we collected 400 bucks that day for House of Friendship, and uh, one of the, uh, the the centerpiece of the two-page spread was Pete and I sitting on top of an IBM 1800. So Pete's holding a PC Junior, and uh, we had to climb up on a ladder to sit on top of this mainframe. So, uh, to carry on with uh, a bit of my background, I worked for a lot of companies. That's high tech for you. All the, the black co the companies that uh, appear that have the black uh, rectangle in the second column no longer exist. Uh, the companies with the uh, yellow uh, were take the exist, but under a different form now because they were taken over by the venture capitalists. The uh, the, the the companies management floundered. Whatever. And so we were eyewitness takeovers. And in one case, uh, we uh, were in, we we met our venture capitalists who came up from Boston, and the CEO of the company introduced them. And then the first thing that the senior most venture capitalist said is, "You're fired. I'm now the CEO, 
and we got down to business. So I've actually seen the stuff that you see on, on uh, TV. It actually takes place. And uh, then the companies in the last column actually have new owners entirely. And so you won't even find these companies out. The company I currently work for, Universal Properties, as you can see, started off as GeoSign, it was renamed eMedia, and now we're Universal Properties. And now though, as of last June, we were purchased by Waterloo's newest conglomerate, Rebellion Media. So if you want to check out Rebellion Media's website, it's fairly slick, and we're one of their uh, divisions. So this kind, of, uh, this kind of job history in Kitchener-Waterloo, very typical. On that list, you'll see, you, you might have seen a uh, burgundy bar, and that was the time spent on the Commercial Computing Museum, or the Computer Museum. So, uh, 1996 was the 50th anniversary of the ENIAC. And so we thought, what a great time to use all this computer stuff that we have just collecting dust. And so uh, we decided to announce a museum uh, to coincide with uh, the University of Pennsylvania's announcement of the big festivities that would take place down in uh, Pennsylvania around the uh, anniversary of the ENIAC. And uh, so we became a federally registered charity uh, through friends, uh, uh, like the lawyers handled that for us pro bono. And then we approached the uh, Waterloo County Board of Education and asked for a high school gym because the warehouse space I had at that time was just across the street from this high school. And we thought how slick it would be if we could have the gym, we could display these mainframes and not just sort of like, you know, one CPU after the other, but we'd, we'd set them out as they were set out and arranged in the data centers we obtained them from. So. Uh, as you came into the gym, you saw an IBM System 360 Model 22 with key punches, key to tapes, uh, the five platter disk drives, card reader, card punch, high speed printer, tape drive, CPU, and the control units. When you went beyond that towards the flags, you came to an interact. So the, the 360 is a batch system, a, a, key, a card based system. The next system down that has a blue band going across was a Digital Equipment Corporation DEC System 20 which was a, a high-speed multi-user system. And the DEX System 20, which at its core is also called a PDP-10. So it depends on if you're a PDP-10 purist, you know, you'll use different monikers for it. So that's the unit that, um, or that's the same model that Bill Gates and Paul Allen cut their teeth on when they were writing early software for the, I forget what it was called. The Altair. The Altair. <laughs> And then if you go around the corner, you'll, you would have come across an IBM 4300. And there you'll see Ryan in red actually bending over, talking to a lady who's looking at the Univac Model 20. And then in the lower corner here, you'll see uh, the uh, Amdahl 5085 dual processor. See the two, the two cabinets at each end? 2,200 pounds a piece. So when the custodians of the school found out what we were up to, they were terrified until somebody reminded them, well, when you have 300 high school kids in here having a dance, yeah. the floor is going to be just as abused. So it all worked out well for us. And uh, we had a whole total of uh, 200 people come through all, all summer. So we were open five days a week, two days a week, weekends only. Or I guess it, you know, it, we, we cut down over time. Kitchener, Waterloo, high tech. You think techies, techie means any interest in technology? Totally wrong. Only interested in what's tomorrow. This this stuff was completely boring. RIM never answered our phone call. UW never answered phone calls. None of the high tech companies that uh, we approached were a, a, in any way interested in something like this. And so uh, so we shut the museum down in 1999, and everything that we kept came back to our personal collection. We paid off the museum's bills that were owing at the time, and it all came back. So. One thing that happened, though, is uh, I found uh, another collector, a, a fellow named Nathan Miravoy, and he was the retired chief technology officer of Microsoft. And uh, I saw him in a magazine, Forbes magazine, covered him and his eccentric collection passions. He likes to collect meteorites, he like, or you know, the, the parts, bits and pieces of them. He likes to collect dinosaur bones, and he also likes to collect mainframes. So I contacted him, and he bought the 22. So that thing was shipped to Seattle. And then there was an in another interesting uh, Ottawa or Seattle connection and even another Microsoft collection or connection. 
Brian and I actually in 19 or 2001 ish uh, flew to Ottawa and we uh, deinstalled this KL10. This is a real PDP10. And um, we found out that Paul Allen was thinking of opening a computer museum. So, Paul Allen, the co founder of Microsoft, has a museum in Seattle dedicated to the the rock singer who did uh, the Watchtower, Jimi Hendrix. So there's the Experience Museum in Seattle, which is all about Jimi Hendrix, and he had a passion though for putting a computer museum together. So um, we contacted his organization and he bought this. So it went from, there's the uh, picture of the warehouse, so to speak. So there's, there's the, this KL-10 in Ottawa, the KL-10 in Kitchener, and then now it's in Seattle. And you can go to the livingcomputermuseum.com and uh, obtain a uh, user ID because the, the KL-10, the, a DEX System 20, a PDP-7, they're all up and working. He's got uh, a, a staff like you guys to maintain the equipment and you can uh, get a login and you get a dumb terminal emulator and you can uh, pretend you're playing on a machine from the 70s. So, getting back to high tech, to what we're talking about. So now, uh, hopefully you'll believe what I say. But uh, <coughs> high tech to me in the beginning was computers. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't high tech plastics, there wasn't high tech uh, chemicals, there was just high tech electronics computers. So in the beginning, there was, uh, uh, to me, high tech meant computers. And computers, because they were so cool at one time, formed a corporate showcase in most cases. Universities for sure would show them off, but even companies. You know, you'd go downtown Toronto and you could walk around and you'd see these floor to ceiling glass uh, walls uh, that would uh, separate just you on the sidewalk from some company's data center. Confederation Life, companies like that, down on University Ave. Well, in 1969, you might remember a riot that took place at Concordia University in Toronto, and that literally is the is the point is the point that separated computers being a showcase to computers being hidden inside ultra safe uh, facilities. Uh, what Mutual Life did after this happened is they moved their data center from a main floor location where it was easy to get at, not to see, but at least to get at, to uh, an, a, a three-story underground, a 90-foot underground facility on uh, Park Street in Waterloo. So what you see there are uh, the data center was uh, on multi floors up, and so when the students broke in, they threw all the uh, punch cards down onto the streets. So all that white stuff are punch cards. And what I, what I thought was cool was it was a CDC 6600 mainframe in uh, the Concordia University. And that's a front view of the operator's console, so the, the green glow versus Hal's red glow. It's too much of a coincidence. Here's the red room at U of W. So now what I'd like to say is I believe no matter who you were, who you worked for, if you lived in Kitchener-Waterloo, in this time frame, you had easy access to feel comfortable with computing, with computers. They were just everywhere, and uh, this is pre-69, so there wasn't that barrier. So this, uh, the black and white photo, um, shows you know one configuration: the 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 computer with the control panel. There's this, that's the CPU, and everything around it: the disk drives, the tape drives, the printers. Notice how in every picture. They're in a different location, so I get a real kick out of you know people saying how yeah yeah you know their mainframe they had to have an on-site service guy because it broke down every two seconds. Well, that really wasn't the case. These suckers were extraordinarily resilient. Uh, the first ever, th sorry, this is an IBM 360 model 75. Uh, we have at home the control panel from the first, from serial number one of the 75 family. It was built in Poughkeepsie, New York. It was shipped to San Santa Clara. That's now. I'm sorry. One of the Santas down in uh, in California, where there's an IBM Research Center. Claus. Pardon? Claus. Claus. No, Claus. Santa Claus. Yeah. yeah. It had to be a Spanish name, okay? And um, and then sent to Philadelphia, 
and then sent back to New York. And each place over that lifetime, the sucker worked fine for whatever project it was used on. So the red room, as you can see, these uh, second floor windows, floor to ceiling windows, this was deliberately a showcase. The reason it's called the red room, obviously, the walls, the floor, all the same uh, color, uh, red, orange. And if you wonder why that is, well, the architect who designed the building contacted IBM and said, uh, when this building opens, we're going to house a big IBM system. What colors do your IBM computers come in? And IBM said, well, we have a bright sun yellow, we have a sea blue, and we also have an orange. And the blue and the yellow aren't going to be available upon release, the, the launch date, so you might as well go with the, with the red. And so that's what the architect did. But then the people who run the data center found out that the computer was going to be the same color as the walls and the floor. And for safety reasons, they demanded that they get a non-red computer. And so people weren't walking into the computers when they're on their shifts. And so that's how this ended up to be this wonderful clash. But everybody knows a big blue anyways. And um, this unit over here at the side, uh, sorry, I just wanted to clarify too that, um, so this is like deliberately a showcase, right? Anybody could go on campus free of charge, walk up, and thousands of people did. This was, uh, you know, you'd often have gawkers looking down into uh, this operation. So this unit over here the, below the logo, that's a, a disk drive. So each one of those small windows, you see down there, there's nine windows, there'd be a 10 platter disk pack. So there's a, there's a platter sitting downstairs across from the, uh, the entrance. So that would be a 10 pl platter disc pack. You want to take a stab at it? So this is 1966, what the capacity of each one of the packs were. It was 29 megabytes, 29 megs. And the ninth one was offline until one of the other eight broke. So that was your backup unit. So it came with a built-in backup unit. And it was 285,000 Canadian at that time. What UW also did, which was quite extraordinary, was that on film? <laughs> and you said that's what largest charges for that much data. <laughs> um, UW had what's called a self serve cafeteria style computing. So, again, no matter uh, what program you were in at UW, if uh, you needed the computer, you virtually used it yourself. What you do is you punch up your, your uh, program or just your data cards because your professor might give you the cards that invoke a program that's already existing on the computer and then another card to put at the end of your data so that the, the program knows, okay, that's the cutoff point. You'd get that, you'd walk up to the uh, uh, operator who has a tie. In front of the operator, you can't see it, but there's a, a card reader. So you'd give your operator the cards the operator would put the cards in, and when they get a nice stack of cards, you push the read button. They'd go shooting through. He'd know how to separate the decks. He'd put them on the other side. While this is happening, you'd walk down the left side of uh, the operator. And if you can see somebody sort of leaning on an elbow in this photograph, and there's a, a white button above their elbow, that's a 1403, 1100 line a minute printer. So you, by the time you got to the end of your line, there was your output. You'd advance the paper at the back, rip it off, it's all perforated, and walk around and pick up your deck and carry on. What year was it? 1966, 66. you know, into the 70s, yeah. So this cafeteria-style computing, you know, U of W knew what they were doing. They were making it just so easy, so comfy. They, there were no white coats. There was no high security. Uh, to prove that point about high security, I had my first computer account when I was 12, I just walked up to a person in an office and asked for an account. They just wrote it down, typed it in, and authorized it. So I could use the computer free of charge all those years. The reason being is the U of W's management knew this is so new. You know, you could virtually have a thousand simultaneous users. Everybody across campus coming in electronically through uh, typewriter type terminals. You got all these students using this, plus you had the administration doing all the student records, payroll, everything else, all being done on that 75, that, that one mainframe. So they didn't know what they were getting into. So what they wanted to do, they encouraged people to do things 
to bring the system down, to crash the system. And then they'd learn by that. You know, so they had a they had a really good outlook. So computers were up close and friendly at U of W. And they also had computer science days where uh, high schools in, in Ontario were invited to get busloads of students who would come down on Saturdays to a very structured day. You'd be given a, uh, a, paper, a plastic bag with uh, some pre-punched decks in them already, and you'd go through the cafeteria-style computer, you'd go through some lectures, and uh, you'd key punch your own uh, other programs or, or additional data. So these computer science days, they think uh, 10,000 students from Ontario got this warm and fuzzy experience with uh, computers. Here's this picture I mentioned, it was talking about, there's all these Commodore 64s, but the focus here is on these two boxes. For those high schools that couldn't come to computer science days, U of W had a van, and in this van, they had a, they had a dolly on wheels that would fit three of these boxes. So you see printer, card reader, and then there was a CPU. So they had a PDP-8, a mini computer, in a box, a compatible card reader and a compatible uh, printer that they take out to high schools and easily wheel them on and off this van. And look what happened to U of W. But more than anything else, everybody got this warm and fuzzy feeling. Computers aren't, they're, they're just a tool. I can do anything I want with a computer. I don't have to be afraid of them. 1983, there's the data center. So the 75's gone, the control panel's gone. Those CPUs now, they're 4300's waist height computers. And uh, a, a movie company producing a film called Utilities, which you can actually, you know, find, uh, made in Toronto. They needed to blow up a computer, and somehow U of W offered the data center. So in 1983, there was, uh, you know, um, all the camera crews in that, and they did a, uh, an explosion, a pyrotechnic display simulating blowing up uh, that computer. So that's the first explosion that we'll talk about today. There's another one coming up. And again, around town, uh, Duke Street, King Street, parallel to King Street in downtown Waterloo, IBM had their data center. There was computers of that type always available for the passerby to look at. Is that, that, is that in your office still? That, uh, that, that control panel? Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you asked, though. Uh, if you've ever been on Weber Street, where Ki Kitchener and Waterloo, the boundary line between Kitchener and Waterloo, it's the old BF Goodrich Canada head office. It's now self storage and Service Canada. Interesting mix. And but for the original days when it was BF Goodrich, you'd see that particular machine in those windows, and people just talked about it. You know, they'd say, oh yeah, they were really busy at BFG last night, eh? You know, there was a whole pile of people in the data, you know, in the computer room. And uh, it was just that, if you lived in Kitchener, Waterloo, <coughs> and you gotta remember, population of Waterloo, 32,000. Population of Kitchener, 80. I theorize that the number of cycles per second per capita were the highest in Kitchener, Waterloo than any other part of the world unless there was a U.S. defense facility near, underneath the city. But um, we had so many machines for such a small population. And I think there's... Oh, this is a photograph of that 360-65 being actually, you know, humorously yanked out of the data center in 1983. Uh, here's uh, Greb Industries off of the expressway. had twin 360-40s. It was a real IBM town, though, kitchener Waterloo. And uh, also, the uh, Board of Education had a 1130 for student processing, run by students also at this particular uh, high school. So if you were in computer programming in uh, high school during this time, you actually got to touch the machine again. You didn't have to mail out your, your programs and wait two weeks for them to come back. So no matter what you did, you didn't have to be a part of the high-tech community back then. Computers were just everywhere, out in the open. So here's the first company we'll talk about, Electrohome. I think you've all heard of Electrohome before. So uh, a very popular company. It actually started in 1907, but then they got into vacuum tubes in 1920. So literally, because of that, we can claim in Kitchener-Waterloo, we're approaching the second century of high tech in Kitchener-Waterloo. Yeah, it's the beginning of the second century, yeah. And um, so Electrohome also 
didn't just do the guts, they did the cabinetry and they had their own woodworking plant. They sold furniture after a while in addition to the cabinets they made for their own products. They were quite the company. So I'd like to draw your attention to the top right and in the bottom two. Very slick equipment. 1963 is when the modular system came out. So you could buy even a bar that had the same legs, the same panel, the front cover, the same textures as the modules that had your TV or your record player or you, you see the big speaker, the end speakers. It was all one modular system. So IKEA eats your heart out. And to me, I can't, I can't but think, isn't this like Apple? This industrial design, this concept, these concepts that the round, uh, attractive redwood uh, turntable and uh, radio, and you see the lady with her elbow over the uh, chair. Well, that chair came with it because the speakers were built into the wings of the chair. And then here's the, the, the Tempo product line. It was just slick. I just thought it was very interesting. There's nothing truly remarkable. So who's responsible for this? Well, the Electrohome Company, uh, in its heyday, were three generations of the Pollock family. Uh, A.B. Pollock, C.A. Pollock, and J.A. Pollock. Um, C.A. Pollock is the fella who's responsible for this kind of stuff. He's the second generation, and so in the 40s, if I had that right, sorry, when TV was just coming out, he saw that the Electro Home had to get into it. That was a deal breaker. If they didn't get into TVs, no future. So what he did is he convinced the board to give him $5,000, a huge amount of money, of course, in that time, he went to a manufacturer in Chicago, bought a bunch of them, had them shipped up, and he didn't just give them all the engineering and say, you know, here, reverse engineer this. He put them in, in the cafeterias of all the plants, whether it was woodworking or the phonograph radio plant. And he said, his theory was, I want the employees to push us in, to say, if you, you know, if you don't, if we don't get into TV soon, you know, there's no future for us, you, you know, get off your your hind end management and get going. So he wanted the company to push Electro Home into it, and that's exactly what happened, with huge successes that, that they had in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Carl Pollock, too, was the kind of guy who, uh, uh, yep. I had too many coffees, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carl Pollock, um, my dad worked for Electro Home all those years, when he was a line guy. He was on the assembly lines all those years, and my mom and dad were at a fundraiser for Laurier. Carl Pollock was there, and the story goes that Carl Pollock found my dad and said, Hoobie, how are you? So he recognized him and knew his, remembered his first name after all those years. Quite a remarkable man. You might have also seen these monitors. They were the ubiquitous uh, airport monitors for the longest time. Toronto airports, all the U.S. airports would have those sort of stacked up in a matrix with uh, departures and arrivals. And here it's the uh, early projection systems that uh, preceded the digital, totally digital systems now developed by uh, Christie. Who, and the Christie company now occupies the previous head office of Electrohome. Unfortunately, Christie is owned by a Japanese firm one generation away from Kitchener. So. The second company is Marsland Engineering. And uh, so, Marsland was a, uh, a custom producer. So they did work for um, armies, you know, defense organizations around the world right from day one. Uh, they would do things like for Bell Canada, they made the early test jigs you know, for the linemen to have to be able to just clip onto the wires and be able to make telephone calls. And something else that they did was when Telex, TWX, was just coming into vogue, anybody here? Uh, like Telex was the original replaced telegraphs. So instead of using Morse code, Telex allowed you to use a typewriting device to communicate between offices. So um, the um, government slapped huge tariffs on these devices. So Stan Marsland went to Stokie, Illinois and picked up the manufacturing license to make teletypes in Canada and they made them by the thousands. And the thing is, in each one of these units, there's at minimum 1,000 parts, little springs, little little elbow levers, little little thousands of things like that. 
and they all worked in this perfect harmony. They sold thousands. Another thing that Marsden was involved with that I don't think is going to be so much relevant to this to mo m many in this group, but Canada Post, uh, sorry, um, uh, Canada Post held the country hostage a few times in the late 70s with national mail strikes. And you can imagine, because of the dependence on paper at that time, uh, that, that had a huge impact on households and businesses across Canada. Canada Post, the uh, posties went on strike because of automation. And the thing is, no one knew, and so sort of after the fact, the automation, these big mail sorters, were made in Waterloo by Mars and Engineering. You know, they were able to keep that under the wraps, because you can just imagine where all the demonstrators would go you know, if they knew it was that close. They were made under license in Waterloo from a, um, a license obtained by a company in Japan. Now another interesting side to Mars and Engineering, here's where the second bang comes in, the second explosion is um, uh, Marsland was purchased by a company called Lee Instruments, an international firm out of Ottawa, and brought in a new general manager. So there was no longer a Marsland family member at the helm. This gentleman had a, uh, a background in arms, the arms business. And so we obtained a contract with the Libyan government to build a, uh, a, a night scanner. So a GMC truck was retrofitted to work in deserts and this camera and all the other electronics behind it were, were built into the back of this uh, truck and um, I can tell you that uh, when I saw this camera in action the one night and you know being a kid I knew I knew the fields I was looking into and I remember like the trees that were there and I could see those trees clearly and this is 1978-ish. Uh, well it turns out that 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 camera was never supposed to leave uh, the United States. It was one of these banned products because it was so advanced. We got several in Waterloo. As a result, the general manager uh, was tracked down and hunted down by the uh, U.S. Uh, Department or State Department uh, years later. How did the government know that this happened? Well, I mean, there was obvious aspects. They're, they're, they have all their intelligence sources around the world, but also one morning in uh, uh, 1979, uh, our general, Marsland's general manager's Jaguar blew up in his driveway. And the police, to this day, the police reports still say it was a, a wiring problem. Okay. But the, the, the State Department got wind, and in, in like if you investigate the story, the State Department were interviewing an ex-CIA agent who spoke about a job he put out to another ex-CIA agent in a podunk place called Kitchener, Ontario, and it was just around the same time as this car explosion. I'm drawing the conclusion that that's what it was all about, and it had to do with this Libyan deal and the whole bit. So that's the second explosion. The first one was a fake one, the second one was a real one in little old Kitchener, Ontario. And the third company, Raytheon. Raytheon the, the, the big microwave and radar manufacturer has always had a dish of some kind in, uh, on, on its facility on, um, just off campus of UW. And when I was learning how to drive, I distinctly remember driving around the bend on Phillips Street and seeing a large door open up and instantly shot out a four missile, like a, a, a big uh, assembly with four missiles on it. It rotated, it tilted, it did all sorts of fancy movements and the thing is, it was just like a Disney uh, animated cartoon. The precision of these movements was just bewildering. Now, I've had several people who have seen this corroborate this memory, and that's because um, Raytheon was given a contract to uh, work with NATO on ship-based uh, uh, missile launchers. So they put one of these missile launchers in a cargo uh, loading dock, and that's the door that I saw coming up. And uh, they'd, they'd shoot it out, and then they'd see how well their dishes handled all the uh, tracking requirements that were specified. So what Raytheon brings to the mix, not so much that, you know, not the industrial design and this extraordinarily creative management technique that uh, the Pollux did, or the feisty nature, the, the remarkable stuff that uh, Marsland made and their unique history. They brought money. 
1956, we're talking about $8 million contracts, $5 million contracts, $3 million contracts, huge amounts of money. Why did Raytheon ever come to Kitchener-Waterloo, you might ask? Stan, or sorry, um, Carl Pollock. Carl Pollock got everybody excited about TVs, their radios, their consoles, you know, their record players that were just, sales were shooting. He couldn't convince RF engineers, radio frequency engineers, to change jobs from the high-tech mecca of Canada at that time, which was Montreal, RCA, Sylvania, all those companies had uh, huge plants in Montreal. Couldn't convince them to move from Montreal to Kitchener. So when he heard Raytheon was looking to expand internationally, he fought hard for them to pick Waterloo. They picked Waterloo under the theory that, okay, now RF engineers have two companies. They can either work for Raytheon or Electrohome. And that increased the chances of Electrohome being more successful by having Raytheon there. And so uh, C.A. Pollock was the uh, president of Raytheon Canada for the first 18 months that it was in Canada at the same time he was president of uh, Electrohome. Quite the guy. Uh, NCR. What NCR brought to the mix, I think, was hugeness. So they bought this 37 acre property. They built a 200,000 square foot plant and office space, uh, enough parking for 3,000 cars that were often filled because this plant at one time worked uh, three shifts, uh, seven days a week, making backroom banking equipment, uh, the equipment that would encode uh, amounts and other data from uh, checks. So you write a check, you give it to the teller, the teller then hands it over to somebody operating a machine like this that would magnetically encode the amount and the date and things like that so that it could be processed by uh, uh, automated equipment after that also. At one point in time, NCR had a moving company from Waterloo working uh, um, a couple times a week taking families from Dayton who lived in Waterloo back to Dayton and then loading up the trucks with new families to come to Waterloo. So it was just a, it was just a back and forth for the longest time. It was just the enormity. And likewise, too, there was global responsibility for this product line. So you lived in Waterloo, you knew maybe Elmira, possibly Brantford, and then now suddenly you knew the rest of the world if you worked there because you were shipping all over the place. You were designing for all these different jurisdictions. That, uh, the, N the NCR, that's, I believe that's what they're going to develop into the new data center complex. Oh, yeah? Is what I've been hearing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the, the, the whole property is up for sale. Yeah, so it's, they're going to use the existing building that's there and then build that out. I'm not sure about the surrounding property, but it's supposed to be a very large data center. Interesting. Cool. Well, I know in Guelph, where I work, Royal Bank and the Ministry of the Ontario Government have their backup data centers mm -hmm. in two huge buildings. Volker Cray brought, you know, uh, homeless. It, it, these were local boys. There was a Volker and a Craig and, a, and another person, the three people, uh, got together and made these dumb terminal products. Uh, they were designed and developed on uh, Marsland Drive, across from the high school that we eventually, you know, occupied for a summer as a computer museum. And so what these guys, is, everybody wanted to know how the Volker Craig was doing. You know, how's their stock doing? Oh, I hear they sold this to that company and that to that company. So we were now drawn in because of this, uh, this that we knew these guys from high school or whatever, right? They weren't just large companies from the U.S. that no one knew anything about. It was that uh, draw, drew us that much closer to home. Volker Craig ended when they were purchased by a company called Naboo. And I, I wonder, Chief Curator, do you have any Naboo stuff? Not yet. We're hoping, but yeah, we that, do have a Volker Craig terminal, but we don't have stuff. So video text, you could say, predated the uh, internet. So even though the internet's existed for a long, long time, it was just used by academics in the military in the States. And uh, so people, though, were having the idea of, well, everybody should have access to all sorts of information. And so Naboo was a company that was going to build the devices and the infrastructure to make news, weather, sports, libraries, all that available in uh, individual homes. <laughs> and then the last company, Hewlett Packard, uh, they brought the uh, ups and downs of uh, high tech to the community. So Hewlett Packard, 
you know, has their roots in the measurement equipment. So getting into uh, field automation wasn't a big stretch. They bought a company out of Richmond Hill called Panacom. And then true to form, they moved Panacom to an old Zares Zellers store <laughs> in Waterloo. So if you know anything about the history of, of Hewlett Packard, they started off in a garage of uh, either Hewlett's or Packard's garage, I keep forgetting which, and which is now an a, a U.S. Uh, monument down in California. And so sort of true to form to that, they moved into an old grocery store. And uh, the automation uh, marketplace was dwindling, so they had to figure out what are we going to get into, where can we use our expertise, and they got into a new market of diskless uh, network computers. And popularly, they're, they're, they're called thin clients by some, or they're also called X-terminals because they were based on the X-Windows system, the Unix-based X-Windows system. So, so there's a, uh, one of the, their units. So in that unit, there might be 32 gig or 32 megabytes of uh, RAM and uh, uh, extraordinarily high-speed processor suitable for doing engineering, CAD operations, engineering calculations, but no disk. So that it was a client-server type system. And uh, so that's why these were called thin clients. They had all the power of the server, all the processing power, but they didn't have a hard drive. So they got into that market. And uh, so in 1984, Panacom, um, uh, is purchased and they move into the empty uh, Zer Zeller store. Sales are below $20 million by 1990. And then they, at, around that time, they're shifting into the X terminal business. Within three years, zero to 144 million worth of uh, sales in X terminals. And then notice the other side of the curve. <laughs> Just a plummet. One day, the VP of marketing walked into a meeting and said, we, our pipeline is virtually empty. Nobody wants to buy these anymore. And that was when the uh, uh, Windows, um, sorry, multi-user, single user, how do you distribute software updates in a company of 5,000 people? You can't walk around to each one of them. How do we do it? So does the network take over? All those kind of questions were lingering. And until the dust settled, X terminals were forgotten. So one of the interesting things about this story is that uh, towards the peak of that 144 million, Cupertino, uh, Hewlett Packard head office in Cupertino agreed to the persistence of Waterloo's management for their own building. So land was purchased, this building was built and was occupied for about 18 months before IB, or HP pulled the plug, closed down the division, and sold the building to RIM. So Kitchener Waterloo, from janitor to chairman of the board, you know, you were used to this stuff. It just happened regularly. And so that's the story. What do, what do all these things have to do? They have to do with hanging around uh, over the fence, talking about this uh, thing that I work with. It's got a thousand moving parts, and it works every time. You know, it's got to do with having these really, really brilliant ideas about, well, why don't we put the speaker in the chair? You know, we can sell both products then, the chair and the uh, radio and the cabinetry. Um, we were exposed. If you lived in Kitchener, Waterloo, there wasn't a way that you couldn't be exposed to high technology. <coughs> and what does it mean? I think that Kitchener, Waterloo became a community of high technology. Now, let's, let's make the, the, the difference here. We're not saying that Kitchener Waterloo is a high tech community because in your mind you could conjure up what is it, Satellite City or Orbit City where the Jetsons live? Yes. That could be a high tech community. We're a community of high tech. And Kitchener Waterloo, if you live there, no matter what you do, no matter how close your paycheck is related to high technology, you know high technology. You can't help but uh, avoid high technology if you live there. So people in Kitchener Waterloo just simply know and do high technology. That's all there is to it. And in fact, that's all there is to the presentation. <laughs> so thanks very much.